Does trauma ever go away? What can be done to lessen its lasting effects? And what sort of help is out there for people dealing with trauma? Welcome to the search bar. You've got questions? Let's find some answers. Bypass Google and sidle up to the search bar instead, as Central Michigan University's amazing team of experts helps us answer some of the internet's most asked questions. I'm your host, Adam Sparks, and on today's episode, we're searching for answers about trauma. Nikita Murray, Director of Diversity Education at Central Michigan University, is here to help us do just that. Hi, Nikita. Thanks for coming in and talking to me. Um, we're gonna we're gonna talk a little bit about one of your one of your many interesting backgrounds at, in counseling. We're gonna talk a little bit about trauma, how people navigate trauma, and how uh, probably we all have a little bit of trauma that's informing the way we're behaving as adults. But I thought it would be helpful if you could uh, tell our audience a little bit about what your background is um, when it comes to a trauma as a topic. Sure. So I am a licensed professional counselor by trade. Um, and as a part of starting that journey, I developed, I still call it an opportunity to um, help you feel what had experienced physical or sexual abuse in their lives somewhere along the way. So either their family experience that it was a part of their upbringing or they directly experienced it. And that just put me on this path to understanding the importance of trauma-informed practices in, in everything that we do and just really looking at how much we walk around with these experiences that we've had that shape or in some kind of way drive our lives. And, you know, when we're our best selves, we've been able to attend to it and kind of not let it manage us. And when we haven't attended to it is where we see kind of problems pop up. And so what can we as um, professionals do to just try to help people live their best lives and be their best selves. I think what would help to set a baseline of at least where your opinion is on this. I want to define trauma. Like what is the difference between just trauma and regular stress? Like, so just if, if people are having a hard time kind of pinpointing, at least from your professional um, experience, what is trauma? Well, I, I always try to explain trauma in the simplest form. And it's when something happens in our life that basically Shakes, shakes us to the degree that it changes how we see ourselves, the world around us, and how we do things, then that is a trauma or a traumatic experience in life. And it's not the same as stress or an accident, you know, where something um, occurs we address it and we kind of reset and move on. Those things can be temporarily jarring for us, but they don't have the longevity of a traumatic experience where it's embedded in us, where we significantly change our lives and how we live live our lives because of it. And then, of course, trauma has a range of how it's experienced to the most extreme to, again, something that happens occurs, we can process it and reset ourselves, recalibrate, and like go back to life. And part of, I think, the struggle that we have, you know, as people in understanding trauma is that we've like made the world, the word so casual, right? Yeah. So like we substitute it for embarrassment. Like you hmm. went to holler at somebody or say hello to a crush <laughs> um, and that person turned you down and you know, you were a little hurt by it. You were a little embarrassed by it. Maybe people saw it happen. Mm -hmm. And so that experience for you, especially when we're younger, we'll say, oh, I was traumatized by that. Uh, no, you were a little embarrassed by that. You will get over it. But it was mm -hmm. not um, the true sense of a trauma. To get back to even how you started out and thinking about, well, what is trauma? Trauma is that thing that happens outside of your control that was so impactful that it changes how you see the world and you see yourself to the degree that it prevents you from doing things how you normally would 
mm-hmm. then it, it changes you. It changes how you do things. You you live with it and it's living with you, if that makes sense. And what would be, what are those common signs? What are the common uh, effects of trauma? Like So even when you think about those responses, uh, those are re- survival responses, right? Mm-hmm. And there is some of that to a traumatic experience. And, mm-hmm. and we are, we do have to de- decide how we're going to survive it. And what's interesting about the fight, flight, or freeze mechanism is that we don't even get to decide which one of those we're going to use at any given time. When you hear people who respond to someone else's survival of a traumatic incident and they say, oh, I would have done this thing. Yeah. No, you wouldn't have. You would have done what your brain told you to do in that moment because really it's your brain that's making the decision about will you fight? Will you freeze? Mm-hmm. Will you run? Like you are, your brain makes that decision for you and the nerd in me is resisting going into all of the brain mechanisms. Like why does the amygdala um, why that, dump yeah. it <laughs> <laughs> So when you think about the fact that we've all, for the most part, survived a global pandemic, mm-hmm. we've never experienced anything like that in our current generation. And yet we have expectations of our spouses and our partners, our children, our employees, our faculty, our coworkers, our students. And a lot of it is unrealistic because we haven't taken the time to think about how the trauma of surviving a global pandemic where people died in ridiculously large numbers that we didn't have a handle on. And oh, by the way, we were isolated away from support systems or in unhealthy systems. We've taken off the masks and we've gone back to routines, but we've never taken a step back to unilaterally process what that experience was like for all of us as human beings who lived through that together because that definitely was a traumatic experience. The danger of how we react to people who might be experiencing trauma, not just from the pandemic, from, from anything, is, anything. Yeah. is treating it like it's a matter of toughness. Right. Um, or weakness. Or weakness. Because yeah. sometimes the people who are perceivably the toughest people sometimes have the worst trauma. Mm-hmm. Um, and maybe the expectation of toughness, I think we learn this more and more, is, is what's preventing them from recovering. Like we, we see this when it comes to combat veterans, um, emergency responders, first responders of different kinds, like people who are exposed to things that it's going to change them whether they like it or not, regardless of whether right. they're able to deal with it in the moment, you're, you're forever changed by something that is, that, that's sort of over, overwhelming you, right? If that changes your behaviors in other areas or entirely, it's not a matter of toughness because you don't always have a choice for mm-hmm. what trauma does to you, right? It's not a decision that you're making. It's not a decision that you're making and you know, even what we view as toughness really behind the scenes is the ability to compartmentalize Mm -hmm. and how some people are, I won't even say better at compartmentalizing things than other, because just like with anything, if you pour too much water into a cup, eventually what's going to happen with the water in the cup, Mm -hmm. it's going to run over. It's going to overflow onto other things. And so when you compartmentalize things that are happening in your life, Mm -hmm. things that have happened in your life and how you're responding to those things. Eventually, something is going, eventually there will be a need to release. And that release can happen in healthy ways or unhealthy ways. Um, And we've seen examples in society of how it happens in unhealthy ways and certainly horrific ways. And, you know, we, at the same time, we see, you know, ways in which people supplement the need to release with alcohol or drugs or other forms of addiction mm-hmm. or other forms of unhealthy behavior. So it just, it becomes an, an issue of getting help for it and help could look different and help could mean different things. Of course, with me being a mental health professional, right, I'm always going to lead with talking to somebody and getting professional health help from a, counsel- a mental health therapist of some type, whether it's a counselor, 
a social worker, a psychologist, get help from somebody who is trained to be able to help you. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then you can supplement the rest of your your growth and your your change with other ways like life coaches and stuff like that. But mm-hmm. when it comes to mental health issues, you need to tap into somebody who's skilled in working with mental health issues, who understands mental health. Um, then you could go to your pastors and, you know, people like that or your clergy or however that looks, whoever your yeah. guru is. When you're seeking therapy, you're seeking counseling. We talk about either past trauma or childhood trauma, which are, I think, common things that people are coping with. And sometimes we're coping with them really late, right? right. We're coping with them really late in life. And there's kind of, to me, it seems like the co- the two common things are like unpacking it, right? Mm. And then there's also and the other thing, which is I'm going to develop tools to alleviate it, right? Um, you know, what does that look like and how common is that for people that you have come across? It's about survival. And I know that it might sound like a cliche and I keep going back to it, but mm-hmm. it really is a truth. Every day we're all trying to survive in our own way. And people who have survived a traumatic experience of some type have learned, have either learned to live through it. It no longer drives them in the way that it could have or would have had they not addressed it, or if they hadn't come up with um, a good way to live life through it compared to somebody who hasn't addressed something. The work is unpacking it. So not necessarily going back to what happened to them as a child, because sometimes people want to address that, sometimes they don't. Mm -hmm. But really looking at how that experience helped to shape who they are today and looking at what is the impact of that on you being the person that you want to be today and Mm -hmm. want to be going forward. So like sometimes it would be easy to to scare off people when they think they've got to do this deep work and just dive into all this unresolved stuff because sometimes it's just too painful to bring up. We can only do it in levels. And so you respect the level where the person is. So I'm person-centered in my counseling approach, which means, you know what, Adam, it's your bus. You're the expert in Adam. I'm here to help you work on whatever you want to work on for however you want to work on it, however you want to work on it. If you want to drive your bus off the cliff, that's your right to do it. Just give me a heads up so I can jump off the bus Mm -hmm. because I don't want to go over the cliff with you. And so however you want to work on whatever your past trauma was, we'll do that. If you decide, nope, I don't want to talk about this ever again, or I don't want to talk about this anymore, that's a person's right to do that. Right. And so when we think about people who are who are recovering from a trauma, we have to see it from the lens of them knowing what happened in their life and what they're able to open up for themselves without releasing everything look at it like vomiting Mm -hmm. and that's how i used to you know describe it to kids like very pleasant (laughs) right (laughs) you know we have an upset stomach it's bothering us we know we want to get rid of it and history has shown us like you know if i if i throw up i'm gonna feel better i don't like to throw up it's nasty nasty Mm -hmm. it's messy it's all these things but inevitably when we vomit whatever we are able to get out and get rid of we're done with it and we mm. go back to feeling better again. Do you feel that there are a lot of people who are missing signs that there's trauma that they're not dealing with? If I'm carrying around a bunch of kind of unacknowledged trauma that I might benefit from ha- working on, what are some signs? Are there common signs that like, hey, like I'm, this might be baggage that I'm holding on to or it might be a, a trauma response that I'm having that I'm not recognizing. What Are there common things or is it just wildly different from person to person? There is some variance based on people, right? Because mm-hmm. we're all different. However, it connects back to how we how we find ourselves responding to things. Right. I think that's that's the biggest telltale sign. And it could be anything. Like if you watched your parent be abused by their partner because they made the spaghetti wrong. Never want to eat spaghetti again as an adult. But here, 
like your partner made you this wonderful meal and thought like spaghetti is is what I'm dope at. So here, mm-hmm. let me give this to you. This is my gift to you. And you you break down crying. You throw it out the window. You refuse to eat it mm-hmm. or you eat it and vomit it. Right. Mm-hmm. With no explanation for why you're having these responses, then you might want to look for why. Look at why are you responding to that and mm-hmm. what's over here that you need to resolve. Otherwise, all your partner is going to know is like, okay, they didn't like the spaghetti. You could have just said you didn't want spaghetti, mm-hmm. right? right? And so we make it about us because we don't know what we're responding to. Yeah, like I should, this is something that... It doesn't match the... Yeah, it doesn't match the thing that I'm reacting to. Yeah. I'm having an, This should be joy, this should be pleasure. And mm-hmm. instead it's revulsion or it's fear. Mm-hmm. I would say irrational more than inappropriate mm-hmm. because sometimes a response can be appropriate. Mm-hmm. If you were sexually assaulted, you know, you could have sex with someone a hundred times, your partner a hundred times, and it's just fantastic. Mm-hmm. 101 time, you is you just not Break feeling down. it for whatever reason, mm-hmm. something's going on. Because you've you've been intimate 100 times, that person doesn't understand what's going on with 101. Mm -hmm. Your response could be appropriate for what's triggering you at that time, right? Right. But it may not be rational to that person Mm -hmm. because of the 100 other times. So I would would stay away from like appropriate response and think more about irrational yeah. and if you're having that response it might seem irrational to you, you might not yeah you might not exactly. even know right and exactly. that's that might be the sign that it's that it's that something's it, going on that something's going on it's time yeah. to figure out what's yeah. what's a happening trigger. with me mm-hmm. you know the thing about trauma is that it brings with it a lot of moving pieces and i think we we've, we've kind of talked about that yeah. and hopefully um highlighted that a good example and in my mind i'm like i think i can share this story because i've gotten this position permission mm-hmm. before i observed a welcome home party, right, mm. for one of my family members who was coming home after having spent time in Iraq. He didn't know that his family was preparing this surprise party for him. Mm-hmm. He walks into the room. Everyone yells, surprise. And the look on his face was one of such anger which you wouldn't have expected in that scenario. And I don't know how well his spouse and siblings paid attention to his response. Talked about it a little bit later with a friend of mine who had spent time in the military and did work with veterans. And he helped me to understand that you were looking at a person who has had to spend X number of months staying alive by not being surprised right only to walk into a room to a bunch of people yelling surprise would i say that he had some trauma absolutely Mm -hmm. Um, because there is the literature there's the anecdotal and quantitative literature that talks about the impact of war on veterans Mm -hmm. and then like we just have the whole history of it so it made sense but it didn't make sense to anyone planning that whole process that perhaps jumping yeah. out at him on his first day back home fresh off the plane would be a good thing to do yeah and it's hard to assess that and stuff, it's hard right? to assess that right you know and we want that person to be able to feel comfortable getting help or want to normalize mm-hmm. the idea that we might see them struggle it's, you can't account for you know how wild a, a, a response or how how much of a left turn in someone's life something like that might be, right? You can't account for how wild and you can't account for how silent because it could be Mm -hmm. both extremes. It just really depends on the individual and the support around the individuals or the lack of support around the individuals um, that will determine or help determine how they emerge from it. So here's another example. So in, in the higher ed environment, right, we talked a little bit about the COVID piece, but we recruit students from all over the place, mm-hmm. internationally and domestically, who come in with a whole range of experiences um, and a range of experiences around things like war, famine, resources, policing, life and death. So 
we have individuals who may just be 18, but have experienced vicariously more trauma than many of us who have lived to be 40, 50, 60. Mm -hmm. Like they've experienced more trauma in their 18 years than the so-called adults and experts and uh, all these other people. And so how are we taking that into consideration when we're looking at what we consider to be success behaviors of students then, right? Are we interpreting uh, a student who may need time to reset differently as disrespect or laziness or lack of qualification to be in in college, not taking into consideration that perhaps, you know, this young person might have might have seen two of their best friends die the summer before they started college or a family member and a, a friend die. Oh, but that was a good year because sophomore year, five of their friends died. So mm. we never know what someone is bringing with them into any, just as we've been talking about any setting or any given environment. But for us in higher education, those are the types of things that we should be taking into consideration. People aren't often villains, right? And if, exactly. you're, if your trauma is making you behave in a way that makes somebody else uncomfortable, you might not realize you're making them uncomfortable. So if that person comes to you from a place of empathy, man, they might be doing you a really big service. And how, how, how good does it feel to give someone that room to kind of adjust and that, that room to figure out a way to, to cope with it within you know, the space that you need them to, to, um, to be successful? Right? right. And instead of thinking at, about it from a judgmental perspective or from a place of deficit where we say, wow, what's wrong with that person? Mm -hmm. You know, ask the question, what happened in that person's life? Yeah. Or what's going on for that person today? Right. Those are two, two totally different responses and two simple questions that will yield different answers. So back to your point about empathy, absolutely not just trying to understand the place in which that person is coming from and just kind of leaving it right there but actually engaging in a way where you could potentially gain some information, build relationship, build rapport, build knowledge as a result of dialogue that will help you best understand your students, your colleagues, whatever the case may be. If you're a person who's experiencing trauma or has experienced trauma, it has an effect in your life, what are some personal steps that you could take to lessen its effects? I think I would say if you're someone who has experienced a traumatic event and it is still an issue because people can experience trauma and it not be an issue for them. I just want to acknowledge that. Mm -hmm. um, but it's still an issue for you. It has resurfaced as an issue for you. You're concerned that it might resurface. Something is triggering you. Talk to a mental health professional. That is the number one thing to do. Those are the people who are most equipped to understand what's happening for you. Make getting therapy your number one objective. Mm -hmm. And when I say therapy, I mean someone who can help you unpack or process wherever you are at that point. I'm not necessarily talking about somebody who's going to prescribe you medication or something like that. Sometimes we think we don't have anybody, that we're in this world alone, but mm -hmm. we really aren't. So there are always people that you can talk to, depending on, on where you are. So if you're in, let's say if you're a high schooler and you're still watching this, who's your favorite teacher that you could talk to about anything or you trust? Talk to that person school counselor. Sometimes they can seem busy or too busy with other things, but those people are trained mental health professionals too. They just have other duties as assigned. And at that, I'm going to let us wrap this up. Thank you so much for being with me today. I really appreciate the conversation. I know it was kind of a heavy topic, but um, I feel really good for having had the conversation with you. Thank you for having me here. Awesome. Hopefully we'll get to talk again soon. Take care. Thanks for stopping by the search bar. Make sure that you like and subscribe so that you don't have to search for the next episode.